Get rid of psychological clutter. As I mentioned in an earlier section of this training, watch what you feed your head. In that section, we talked about watching your habits and paying attention to the people you hang out with. While this is important, you also have to take care to make sure that you absorb the right kind of stimuli. In any given day, we subject ourselves to all sorts of inputs. Interestingly enough, for the vast majority of these inputs, we are completely unaware. There are always things that we see, smell, taste, touch, and hear. However, despite the thousands of daily stimuli we are subjected to, we actually only get to remember a small fraction of them. Of these memories, we only analyze or judge an even smaller fraction. Among those realizations, only a very small amount make it to our personal narrative. In other words, only a fairly small amount of the things that we become aware of, analyze, and think about in any given day become new revelations to us regarding who we are. For the most part, they either reinforce things that we already think we know about ourselves, or we simply remember them, think about them, focus on them, and eventually forget them. Now you may be thinking that this is completely normal. You may be thinking that this is just the way things are. For the most part, you're correct. But the problem is we can subject ourselves to all sorts of stimuli that create psychological clutter. Now these are different from emotional clutter. Emotional clutter triggers your feelings about your place in the world, what you're about, what you're capable of, your relationship to people, so on and so forth. Psychological clutter, on the other hand, involves psychological routines that shape your personal narrative. The way that you read things produces emotional states. Choosing how you opt to analyze these stimuli takes quite a bit of work. You have to be mindful of how your mind functions. This is where getting rid of psychological clutter really helps. When you police the things that you feed your head, you are able to identify your psychological processes and override them if they were against you. What should you be mindful of? What should you guard against? Like I mentioned earlier, we absorb all sorts of things throughout the day and you have to really classify these things using broad headings so as to warn yourself about their content. For example, we can feed our heads shallow forms of entertainment. This can be worthless YouTube videos. This can also be porn. This can take the form of insults and trolling on comment sections as well as Twitter feeds. These are not 100% devoid of value, but they are essentially worthless because they're so shallow. They don't really engage you on any deep level. They don't challenge your assumptions about yourself, reality, and the world. Instead, they just create some sort of emotional payoff. Your mind is engaged, you're having fun, and that's pretty much it. Another form of toxic psychological input that you should be mindful of involves ideas that make you less content. It's one thing to challenge yourself in your existing preconceptions. It's another to absorb ideas that really erode your ability to be content. Ideas involving your sense of worth, the worth of other people, and life in general. The interesting thing about this is, at first, it starts off as another form of entertainment. You can hang out at certain message boards and people just keep repeating the words kill yourself or saying that life doesn't really matter or there's really no point to anything. There are many variations of this. Now I'm not going to debate the philosophical finer points of these ideas. Maybe on a philosophic, rational, and logical basis, they may be fire where there is smoke. Instead, I'm just going to focus on their effect on you. It's one thing to challenge your assumptions so you can live your life in a more effective way. At some level or another, we definitely need to destroy any false idols that we have involving a mistaken assumption to expectations. That's part of growing up. That's part of being a responsible adult. But there are ideas that can make you less content, precisely because they erode your ability to be content. I hope you see the point here. I'm not talking about coming across an idea that makes you question the religion that you're born with. That's one thing. In fact, in many cases, that's healthy. I'm not advocating atheism here. Instead, I'm advocating people actually believe what they claim to believe. In that situation, whatever religion you're born with stops being a simple label that's passed on from generation to generation and instead becomes truly your own. You actually live out the truths preached by that system of faith. You see it play out in your life. You see that it's reality and it's reinforced in your mind and you consciously choose it. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking instead about ideas that destroy your ability to be content. This involves the nature of humanity and the point of life. There are certain ideas out there that basically lead to the conclusion that it's all worthless, pointless, and useless. How can you be content if you buy into that? 
How can you build something when that is the kind of ideas you surround yourself with or subject yourself to online content that repeats that same corrosive message over and over again? Another type of input that you need to be very careful with involves toxic emotions. If you keep running into content that just almost always automatically puts you in a negative emotional state, there's a problem. If you're feeling a tremendous amount of negativity, you are eroding your personal effectiveness. A lot of people try to trick themselves into thinking that this is just part of them being real. Reality in their minds almost always is negative. If it isn't negative, it's unreal. It's some sort of self-delusion. Well, thinking of life in black or white turns that way. It definitely positions you for toxic emotions. You end up repositioning your world in such a way that your emotional extremes become even more extreme. Finally, you have to stay away from time wasters. Sure, they're engaging, fun, and a lot of people talk about them, but eventually, they just take up too much time. This is time you could have spent developing yourself. This could have been time you spent discovering certain truths about yourself. Make no mistake, opportunity costs don't just apply to economic issues. They also apply to your psychology. For every second you invest in activities that rob you of your time, you're missing out on something more worthwhile. Maybe you could have been doing something that would enable you to become a more in-tune, honest, authentic person who lives in integrity. To get out from under these negative psychological inputs, you need to call a spade a spade. Don't be afraid to label things as they are. It may seem harsh. It might even seem foolish because it becomes abundantly clear that you're engaged in counterproductive thought patterns or allowing yourself to be exposed to this material. You have to overcome your pride and just call things the way they are and simply label them. The more you label, the more you choose to become aware, the less likely you will keep absorbing this information and these stimuli without a fight. At least you become more knowing and aware that this is going on. Eventually, you will be able to take action on them. You will be able to avoid them or work around them. Seek and destroy anti-affirmations. What if I told you that every single day you are playing out a script in your head? You're not super conscious of this script, but if you really pay attention to yourself, you're saying certain things about yourself, who you are, what you're capable of, and what you're about. Psychologists call this self-talk. Now you may be thinking that this is just a simple psychological reporting mechanism. Like you're looking out the window and you're seeing stuff play out. Then you're just describing to yourself what you're seeing. There's some of that but a lot of it really is some sort of running commentary about who you are and what you're capable of doing. You're also telling yourself what your capacities are. You have to be very mindful of your self-talk because if you develop a negative habit of saying negative things about yourself, they become self-fulfilling prophecies. I can understand if you stub your toe or you hit your hand somewhere because of a mistake you've made for you to say, I'm such a dumbass. People do that all the time. That's perfectly normal. But if you keep repeating to that point that it's not really a reflection of a bad mistake you just did right now, then there's going to be a problem. If you keep repeating these negative statements when you remember a mistake you did in the past, what you're doing is reprogramming yourself to be what you fear. If you keep saying you're an idiot, then guess what? You will turn into an idiot. If you keep saying that you're clumsy and you make mistakes all the time, don't be surprised if you start committing more errors. This all leads to a self-fulfilling prophecy because you are programming yourself based on the things that you keep saying to yourself. You have to understand that your brain is not just sitting back and absorbing all this passively. It's not like it's taking it all in and letting it all pass with no effects. It's actually storing it and reading it as some sort of programming and don't be surprised if your negative self-talk ends up holding you back and dragging you down. These are anti-affirmations. You probably already know what affirmations are. These are supposed to inspire you. These are words that are supposed to give you strength and focus. You're supposed to say these things to yourself to pump yourself up. Unfortunately, we also suffer from anti-affirmations, and unlike positive affirmations, we automatically engage in anti-affirmations unless we choose to be aware of them and disrupt the process. We're already doing this. There are five general groupings of negative self-talk scripts you need to neutralize. I've organized them in terms of themes and effects. The first type involves self-talk that kills your self-esteem. When you engage in this self-talk, you program yourself to feel less worthy. You're basically telling yourself in so many ways that you're not worthy, that there's something wrong with you, that you're no good, 
you keep judging yourself in the worst way. The second of negative self-talk scripts involves security. When you say these things to yourself, you make yourself less and less confident and less and less secure. You say to yourself, you're always screwing up. You don't really know what you're doing. You're incompetent. This is different from you're dumb because when you say you're dumb or you have a low IQ, you are getting to the root of who you are. You're eroding your self-esteem. Instead, when you engage in negative self-talk that makes you insecure, you talk about your capabilities. You talk about your capacity to do certain things. Another negative self-talk theme involves your personal effectiveness. You keep saying to yourself, well, that didn't work. Why would it work the next time you try? You keep repeating this type of script and soon enough, you're not even going to try. Why? When the back of your head, you know that there's a high chance that you will probably fail. So why even try? What do you think happens? You become a less effective person because any kind of skill, even if it's something that you know like the back of your hand, will eventually erode if you don't engage in it constantly and consistently. Believe it or not, even riding a bike, which you should know instinctively after several years of riding bikes, can become very difficult if you let enough time pass. This creates a negative downward spiral. You get bad results, you feel worse about it, so you're less likely to try. You also feel less worthy, and this leads to you trying even less, and on and on it goes. There's a tight connection created between poor performance, poor self-esteem, and poor results. Another theme that you should pay close attention to involves your lack of clarity. You can engage in self-talk that erodes your ability to properly see things for what they are. Instead, you just see things as a giant fog or haze, and it's all just wrapped up in a confusing label of your situation. One common negative self-talk script that people use is, I'm just not lucky. It's just not working out. I hope you can see how this leads to confusion, because when you say, I'm just not lucky, you shut off all internal dialogue. There's no need for your analytical and rational side to break down the facts of what's going on in your life in such a way that you can make sense of things. If you just dismiss everything as just a bad roll of the dice, there's no further analysis needed. How can you analyze luck? Things just didn't line up the way they should. Tough luck. This creates confusion. This makes you intellectually lazy because, believe it or not, things don't happen for the most part by random chance. Usually, the results you get are the effects of your previous decisions. The last time I checked, the iron law of cause and effect is still in effect. Decisions that you're making now will play a role in the reality you're going to live tomorrow. This has always been true and will continue to be true. Unfortunately, when you engage in self-talk like luck, the system, or people, or it's all a conspiracy, you create confusion for yourself because you create this logical fog that has some elements of rationality. At some level or another, it kind of makes sense. You end up tricking yourself into thinking that that's all the analysis I need. I don't need to go any further in analyzing these core issues with my life. I just have to go with the fact that I'm just not lucky. When you create this confusion for yourself, you're really robbing yourself of all the power that you already have. Last time I checked, it doesn't really matter what you look like, where you came from, where you are, the mistakes you made in the past. You can always choose to turn things around now. You can allow yourself to be driven by your visions and your hope for the future so that you can move passionately to build the kind of tomorrow you want for yourself. Finally, there's another set of self-talk themes that make you mentally lazy. This is, by and large, related to the confusion that I mentioned earlier, but it requires its own category. Because people tend to absorb these. As the old saying goes, birds of a feather flock together. When you hang out with people, don't be surprised if you start thinking like them. This happens because you absorb other people's attitudes and their way of looking at the world. You wouldn't do this if it didn't work in some level or another. People are not stupid. You're only going to absorb mental habits only if they serve some sort of purpose. At some level or another, it works. But the problem is you may be settling for an idea that is not all that deep. It's not all that comprehensive, and worse yet, you position yourself to live life based on assumptions. Instead of challenging your reasoning faculties, you become stuck. You just look for certain signals and you start jumping to conclusions. Things like racial prejudice, religious bigotry, scientific dogmatism, and similar mental habits make you lazy. 
instead of allowing yourself to be open-minded enough to actually look at the facts and try to come up with different readings, interpretations, or better yet, coming up with your own theory, you start the game with this template in your hands and you're just imposing this template on everything you come across. Not surprisingly, most of the time, you come up with a bad fit. Things that play out in your life don't neatly fit this intellectual template that you use, but people who do this can't be bothered. They become mentally lazy. If they come across a pattern that has five things and two match their assumptions, then that's good enough. It doesn't matter if the conclusion that they come up with is actually not all that good. It's close enough in their minds. Beware of the affirmations that fit any of these five themes. Doesn't matter how you say them, just pay attention to these themes. If the things that you say on a daily basis lead to these conclusions, then you're in trouble. Disrupt them. Try to overcome them. How? One of the most effective is just to simply override them. What this means is you say another affirmation to replace them instead of automatically launching to, well, I'm just not lucky, I'm dumb. You turn things around and say something else. How to craft affirmations that actually work. This subsection is going to be a little difficult because I can't give you some sort of magical laundry list of affirmations that will work in your situation. A lot of other books try to do that, but let me tell you they fall short. Why? They don't know you. The authors of those books obviously can't read people's minds. That's why it doesn't make sense for them to come up with this canned list of affirmations that work on people depending on certain situations. This gives you a certain level of reassurance that they even try to do that, but I think it causes more harm than good. Instead, I'm just going to walk you through a process of you crafting your own affirmations that have a higher chance of working. Why? They actually fit your set of circumstances. They actually reflect your background and experience. They are responsive to how you see the world. First, you need to go beyond the basic and the shallow. When you give an affirmation to yourself, you have to cut to the heart of the issue. Instead of simply just saying, I look good, think of why being told you look good matters. When somebody says that you look good, it means that they appreciate you, see your value, and they think that you matter. Focus on those things. Don't get so caught up in the wrapper, which are the shallow and obvious words. If you do that, your affirmations don't sink deep enough. They're very easy to override or ignore because at the end of the day, your problems may feel like they're so big, so deep, that whatever you say to yourself is simply not going to reach them, much less neutralize them. Strip away the shallow and basic part. Focus on the meat and potatoes inside. Next, you have to custom tailor your affirmations based on how you actually think. This requires that you listen to yourself first. When you say certain things to yourself, how do you phrase it? Do you just say, I'm screwing up, or I scored big this time? Pay attention to your actual internal dialogue and then phrase the affirmation to fit that dialogue pattern. Again, this is something that only you will be able to find out. Based on my experience and research, a lot of affirmations out there just flat out fail because they seem so superficial, contrived, and basic. It's as if you're just trying to hypnotize yourself. You keep repeating these words like they're some sort of mantra, but they're not sinking in. They're not producing the desired effect. But how can they? They don't even fit the way you normally talk to yourself. This is why it's really important for you to focus on how you actually think. How do you phrase these mental words? How do you string them together? Now that you have a general idea of the affirmation you want to give yourself, mold and reshape these to fit the way you normally talk to yourself. That's how you get it to sink in. For more free educational content, visit learnforfree.biz. Content produced and distributed by AllSuperInfo.